Good evening, and welcome to Grace Lutheran Church and School, our Saturday evening service. Uh, a special welcome to our visitors who are here with us either live this evening, uh, or there are some who are visiting with us online as well, too. Uh, so we welcome you also, whether it's recorded and later in the week or, or live right now tonight. Thanks for being with us. A couple of announcements uh, that I needed to make. Uh, as we know, this is a time of year where a lot of people are on vacation, uh, a lot of people are traveling, congregants are doing that, but staff is doing that as well. Uh, so our deaconesses have, well, that's not true, Deaconess May has returned from her conference, uh, and she will be in the office this week, uh, starting on Monday. So we have our regular office hours this week, Monday through Thursday. Uh, church office, as always in the summer, is closed uh, on Fridays. Deaconess Camille will be back on Tuesday then, so they'll both be there together. But I will be out this week. Uh, so I begin a vacation on Monday, and I'll be out the next couple of weeks. Uh, Pastor Massey will be with us on those Saturday nights, so we'll still have church as normal. Uh, also, we will have owls this week. Some people might have that question uh, we will have the Owls Midweek Bible Study, even though I'll be on the road traveling. Uh, tonight, we welcome Ellen Prohl with us. Ellen is our organist. Some of you, most of you should know her, uh, but probably not all of you know her, because this is your first Saturday night, right? So Ellen is substituting for Corey, who is out. We can say hi to her. That would be nice. Yeah. yeah. So she's looking forward to this. She said she always loved Saturday night uh, at her former uh, location. So we're happy to have you with us as well, too. Uh, let's see. One last thing that I did want to mention. Uh, we, we really appreciate, Deaconess May and I, uh, all of your help in trying to find a house or an apartment for our vicar and his family to live in. We've gotten a lot of emails, a lot of calls. Uh, we've been searching, and we actually have uh, signed a lease for a location for them. So thank you very much for all of your help with that. Uh, but he and um, the, our uh, vicar, uh, Poppy, and his wife Haley, and their baby, Sophia, are all good to go with a place to live. They'll get here oh, the end of July, and he starts on August the 1st. So we're excited about that. I know I'm very excited about that. All right, that's everything that I wanted to announce for us tonight. All that we'll need for this evening's service will be on the screen. Since we do have some visitors, I'll let you know that we reference the hymns for you. Uh, if you're somebody who likes to read music and likes to have the hymnal open, uh, you're welcome to do that, but the words will be on the screen for you. At this point, I'll invite everybody to please stand as we call upon our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be stilled, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner.
almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your mercy, guide the course of this world so that your church may joyfully serve you in godly peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Job, the 38th chapter. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you will make it known to me. And where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements, surely you know, or who stretched out the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? 
when the morning star sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb and when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for the sets of bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time, Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and inflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by the truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through the honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us. Be are you restricted in your own afflictions? In return, I speak as to children. Widen your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. He was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even wind and sea obey him. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
I'm wondering this evening if you've ever been like the prophet Jonah. Remember how the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. For their evil has come up before me. Now, Nineveh was a city in the northeastern part of Assyria, several days' journey from Israel. Uh, of course, all of us know that for his part, Jonah didn't want to go there. So he went, he bought a passage to Tarshish, a city that was in the farthest southeastern part of the civilized world. We also know what happened next. How the Lord God caused the seas to swell, or the seas to swell through a great wind, threatening to break that ship apart. How the captain ordered all the cargo thrown overboard to keep that boat afloat. How Jonah was found asleep in the hold, awakened and commanded to pray to his God for perhaps his God would be concerned with the sailors and the boat so that they might not perish. In the end, Jonah knew what the problem was, and he confessed it to those sailors when the lot fell on him. He was thrown into the sea, swallowed by a great fish, and carried back off towards Nineveh. Lesson learned. You can't run away from God. He's everywhere. He knows everything. And he will chase those whom he loves down to lead them back in repentance and faith. Have you ever been like the prophet Jonah, ignoring God's commandments to your own detriment. I'm going to confess that I have. How about this? Have you ever been like the disciples in the appointed gospel for this weekend? Consider them for a bit. While it was the first of several recorded voyages for Jesus across the Sea of Galilee, four of the disciples, Andrew, Peter, James, John, had done it frequently. They were experienced on these waters. For, so for them, this seemed like a routine journey. Now, it had been a very long day of teaching for Jesus, learning for them. No doubt they were all tired as they put out to sea. The importance of what happened next is highlighted by the fact that the Spirit moved not only Mark, but also Matthew and Luke to write about it, including this event in their Gospels. Like any retelling of an eyewitness account, each one has many similarities. But there are also some unique details that help fill in the blanks of what happened. One puzzling tidbit that only Mark recalls is that there were other boats there alongside. It's the only time we hear about them, and Mark doesn't even tell us what happened with them. I'm wondering if that's because Mark included them to suggest that this storm only impacted that one boat. That much like the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea towards Jonah, he just targeted the boat that had Jesus in it. After all, Jesus is the one who said to the Pharisees and teachers of the law that you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. On another occasion, he began to teach two of his disciples, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, interpreting to them from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
Once a believer starts working his or her way through the Old Testament Bible, he or she finds the Son of God, Jesus, in just about every single jot and tittle. For example, I had never associated the coming of the sea with Jonah. Maybe you had, but I certainly hadn't until this past week. Job, certainly. I, I, I was actually on the working group that helped to assemble this year's lectionary back oh, I don't know, a number of years ago, and it was the group that included Job as the Old Testament reading for today. It is one of my favorite passages of Scripture where God appears to Job and says, gird up thy loins like a man. That's how the King James Version puts it. And beyond a doubt, This was one of those gird up your loins moments for those disciples there on that boat. And remarkably, their response was very similar to that of the pagan sailors in Jonah. Indeed, what they said and did next is most telling in regards to the state of their faith. Here's what our reading says. Listen to it one more time. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Really? Fortunately for the twelve, this was a different Jonah in the boat with them far different from the one that was with those pagans who were wondering if perhaps his God would care. In fact, this Jonah was the one who said to a group of scribes and Pharisees that an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it. Could you finish the sentence? except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus is the one who provides the connection between himself and that reluctant prophet. You know, the Bible can't contain every single point of comparison between God the Son, Jesus, and what the Old Testament scriptures said about him. St. John was the one who wrote that there would not be a book large enough to contain them all. Now, the Holy Scriptures are there for you to read, learn, and inwardly digest often yourself in order to make you wise unto salvation. So I'm just going to give you the obvious today. Jesus was a very different Jonah from the original one. Think about this. The first Jonah was traveling away from God and his appointed mission as far as he could get. God the Son, Jesus, was heading exactly where God the Father sent him. Towards the cross. Of course he cared that his disciples were perishing. And not just temporally. Their temporal lives weren't only being threatened. He cared about their spiritual ones as well. Since we already mentioned it, I will again. That at that moment, their faith was incomplete. It was a saving faith. They were trusting in Jesus. But but they weren't trusting in him above all things and for all things. That was apparent. How about you? 
in this regard. I'm sure those disciples in the boat felt that they kept the first commandment, you shall have no other gods perfectly. After all, they never sacrificed to idols, never gathered to worship false gods. Surely they were home free on this one. I I'm sure that you think you're good to go here too. I, I have to admit that I do for all the same reasons think that about myself. I mean, I come to church every week. I go to all three services. Ellen, you'll have that pleasure this week. We must be good, right? Let's just take a look and see how far short we all of us are of God's glory on all of the commandments by listening to what came next. And he, Jesus, awoke and revoked, uh, rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. It's that time of the year where I often will think about summer Greek. You'll notice the foaming at the mouth. And my professor's name was Dr. Veltz. He happened to be the one who wrote the Mark commentary for our Concordia series. It, it's a well-written commentary. I love it. Here's what his translation is of this little bit. You ready? Shut up, be muzzled. I, I actually can kind of see his face saying those words to me when I was whispering to somebody sitting next to me in class. At any rate, Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the waves obey him. Proverbs 9.10 states, you know it, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. As a very interesting aside, many of the Proverbs are attributed to King Solomon. And Jesus said of himself at the end of his referencing of Jonah to those scribes and those Pharisees, one greater than Solomon is here. At any rate, those disciples really didn't need to ask who was with them in the boat. After that display of power over the chaotic forces of the sea, they knew very well who Jesus was. We do too. In a bit, we are going to confess him rightly. Very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. We know who Jesus is. It's just that sometimes we allow things to get in the way and distract us. So much so that we begin to think that God doesn't care about the things that are troubling us. Or, or, or perhaps a bit worse, that for some reason, he's angry with us. At those times, I think it's best to turn to the words of the psalmist. I often teach, those of you who have been in Bible study with me know this, I often teach that psalms are songs about Jesus. The appointed psalm for this weekend is 124. And, and reading it, I understand why. Commentators in their commentaries often refer to Psalm 106 when discussing the calming of the sea. That's a psalm that recalls the parting of the Red Sea. So it's another great choice. My preference, though, is the psalm that our introit comes from. Psalm 107, 
That's the one I'd pick for us today. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Get this next little passage. It was written a thousand years before the calming of the sea. Here's what the psalmist writes. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. You know, it is really fascinating to me that the sailors on the boat with Jonah were saved when he was cast into the sea, and then that the Lord saved him after three days in the valley of that fish. The perfect Jonah, Jesus, saved the whole world by journeying across the water towards the cross of his death. Every step along the way of his life was journeying towards his death. And by this death, the world's sin... Your sin, and my sin too, is forgiven. His on the third day resurrection from the dead proves that. The means of applying that forgiveness to you, well, that's by water also, isn't it? The calmed water of holy baptism in which you receive the Holy Spirit, where the blood of Jesus covered you. These create in you saving faith, a faith that overcomes sin, death, and the cares of the world. Just as St. John writes, in the end, all of the Holy Scripture comes alive in Jesus, for he is God's word made flesh. By him, a safe passage heavenward is forged, that in him we live, move, and have our being. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, so it is a great place to start. Because of what Jesus has done, though, that fear is being turned to joy. For you, dear friend in Christ, are invited to dine with him this night. And then to go out into the world, living a life that extols him in the congregation and praises him in the assembly of the elders. Just as the psalmist has written, if God could use a big fish to get reluctant Jonah to complete the works that were given to him, imagine what he is doing to sanctify those things that you do in faith, the good works prepared in advance for you to do as feeble as they may seem in the moment. God works in and through you to perfect them, to use them for his praise and glory. Rest assured that he is faithful, and he will do this good thing for you until the day he brings you safely to his side. Praise be the holy name of Jesus forever. Amen. And please let's join together in praising God in the words of the Nicene Creed. We stand. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before, O Lord, God of God, light of light, 
very God, a very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again into the world. The Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. He spoke by the prophet. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the prayer of the church. In our prayers this evening, we remember all of those who are listed on our prayer page. Tonight, though, we are going to especially... Um, especially highlight those who are suffering for, um, from cancer, uh, and also the Anna Lynn, who is facing a procedure this week, Martha Rankhorn, who also will be facing a procedure uh, this week, and of course our families who have requested prayers uh, for peace and comfort as loved ones have gone through death to life eternal. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of our salvation, you have ushered in the favorable time and day of salvation through the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Support all your ministers and remove all obstacles from hearing and believing the word they preach. Let your grace be proclaimed through every hardship, struggle, and suffering. And encourage us by the example of many saints to consider ourselves rich and alive despite every opposition. Since we have Christ, we possess everything. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, open wide the hearts of Christians to one another, especially within the home and between neighbors. Let love be genuine, speak truthful, and patience constant. Let us command ourselves in everything as those known by God's love and therefore unashamed to serve one another. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you rule this world by your power. Give to our civil servants respect and recognition of your creation and its nature. When they use the authority given to them from above, let it be in accord with your good design for our world and not the corruption of sin, which they are to rebuke for the good of their citizens. Lord, specifically we pray that you would clear the way for Deaconess May to soon receive her work visa to continue serving us here at Grace. Lord, in your mercy. Mighty Lord, you command wind and wave. Out of your mercy, spare us from disaster. Give, us, give success to crops and suitable rain for the earth. Give protection to those endangered by storms on land, sea, or air. And give us faith both to call to you in trouble and to trust that you will work everything for our good for the sake of Christ, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, you see that we are perishing, yet you bid us to set our fears aside and trust in you for the sake of Christ by whose love we have received peace for our troubled consciences. Do not reject our prayers for, the faith, uh, for their faithlessness, but teach us to trust in you fully. Give your protection and peace to those in need, especially Martha, Anna Lynn, the Shanstrom, Harrison, Fanachi, and Beveridge family. Also for Joan, Jennifer, Lisa, Navisa, Carl, Barbara, Laura, Amy, Kevin, Elsie, 
Chris, Ruth, John, Tim, Marianne, Carl, Feather, Catherine, Mike, Tracy, Beverly, Lisa, Tabitha, Joanne, Kelly, Randy, Krista, Jared, Ryan, Carol, Gail, Joey. Those whom we now name silently in our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, we join with the sons of God and shout for joy as Christ Jesus gives to us his true body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Let us not doubt, but firmly believe your word, that you who formed our world and its matter know well how to present for us and our forgiveness in this sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And at this time, we have a slide that comes up that reminds us about an offering. Our offering plates are up front, so if you brought an offering with uh, and were unaware of this, you can bring that up when you come for the Holy Communion. And we also wish the Lord's blessings uh, to those who have been viewing us online. Please stand. The Lord be with 